its networks. And Meraki is already proving this in San Francisco, where Google and Earthlink have been fighting the telcos for years to get a free citywide municipal Wi-Fi network installed. And last week, Earthlink pulled out because it just couldn't take the political battle with AT&T. But meanwhile, under the radar since February, Meraki has been giving away Meraki minis to folks in San Francisco who agree to share just a small amount of their bandwidth. And so the network has been growing in San Francisco by leaps and bounds. And that's no mean feat in a city that's broken up by great big hills. So the Free the Net SF campaign already has 14,000 users, and I've been tracking it for a while. That's triple the number that it had just two months ago. And it's proof that us mob can seize the spectrum and use it for our own ends. Now, it's fine and dandy for San Francisco, but what about here in Australia where we're suffering under a decade-old pairing agreement which makes us pay and 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 pay for every bit we get out of the cloud? It costs us tens of dollars an hour if we're going to use public Wi-Fi or in the case of the Sydney Convention Center because I investigated getting free Wi-Fi for you during the hour of my talk. It would have cost $800. Internet access in Australia has always been about bending over and taking it like a man. (laughs) Or at least it was. But for the past 35 minutes or however long I've been talking, you've been bathing in Wi-Fi, which I've been providing to you all free of charge. There's a A zone called mob rules, if you want to find it in your wireless, you should be able to connect through it. And here's how I did it. Basically, my N95 is sitting back up in the corner of the room. It's connected to the Vodafone HSDPA network, and it's connected via Bluetooth to a MacBook Pro, which is run by my friend David, who's featured right there, and which is internet sharing uh, from the Bluetooth port out to the Ethernet, which is connected to the Meraki, and there's four Meraki's at triangular points around the room, and so the whole room is basically bathed inside the Ethernet. And hopefully, you know, this is a public demo, you never know, you've all got good signal, and you've got plenty of bandwidth to blog or to check email or do whatever you want to do when I get boring. But here's the kicker. I built this whole thing so that it all runs off of batteries. The the Meraki's only use three watts, so I just made some power supplies for them. And the N95 and the MacBook Pro already have their own batteries, so this thing is good for maybe four hours of fun before someone's got to go find the mains. And because it's entirely battery-powered and entirely wireless, I can drop this anywhere inside Sydney. And if we were outdoors, I could probably cover a square kilometer just with this little kit. And, of course, you can always add a few more. You can add a 1,000 more. All right, Mark. That's nice. It's kind of cool. So big deal. We don't own Meraki minis, and we don't plan on buying them. Well, it's fine. It doesn't matter at all. Because, you see, a mesh network isn't a hardware device. It can run on any hardware you like. You can run a mesh network on Wi-Fi. You can run a mesh network on Bluetooth. If you want to be perverse, you can run a mesh network on infrared. A mesh network is software. And that means that every laptop in this room is potentially another mesh network node listening to the traffic and passing it all along. Consider the density of laptops and desktops equipped with Wi-Fi in a city like Sydney or Melbourne. And now imagine them all as nodes within a vast mesh network. That's where we're going. And ladies and gentlemen, that is only a software update away. When I originally composed this section of the talk, I was going to make a prediction. Because the Nokia N95 has Wi-Fi in it, I predicted we'd soon see mesh networks showing up on mobile phones. As it turns out, I didn't need to make that prediction because two weeks ago, a Swedish startup named Terranut decloaked and announced that they were doing precisely this. So with their software, mobiles don't even need the carrier's network. They simply route packets between themselves until they get to their destination. And you wonder why the wireless telcos fought so long and so hard to keep Wi-Fi off the phones. It wasn't to keep VoIP off the phones. The telcos have known about mesh networking for years. This is what they're afraid of. So watch now as the network frees itself from the authoritarian forms of those most hierarchical of organizations, the telcos. But I did say it was time to play, and it is. 
I want to put the mob rules to work for you because you all need to earn a living. But this world we're entering is so chaotic. It's so accidental. It's so unplanned for. Everything we believe to be true is about to be severely tested. So, rule one, the mob is everywhere. There are very few places on Earth now where you can't send a text. It doesn't matter whether you're in Alun Bator or you're in Timbuktu or you're in Tierra del Fuego or you're in Vladivostok. The network is global. It now encompasses the majority of humanity. And it's interesting to note that within about the same 12-month period that half of humanity became urbanized, half of humanity is living in cities now, that half of humanity will also have a mobile phone. I don't think that's accidental. I think what you're seeing are two sides of the same process. Just as we're being lured out from our villages into the bright lights of the big city, we're being drawn into the unpredictable and unexpected global mob. All right. Rule two, the mob is faster, smarter, and stronger than you are. Now, William Gibson put this much more elegantly when he wrote, the street finds its own uses for things, uses its manufacturers never intended. No one set out to create the arbitrage markets for the fishermen of Kerala. That's something that emerged from the mob. SMS was meant to be used for emergency messaging and now carries several billion messages a day. Just add mobiles and you get a mob. But you can't lure a mob, you can't push a mob any more than you can push a rope. You can pull them, you can lure them, and if you're lucky, you can dazzle them for a moment or two, but inevitably they're going to move along. And that's bad news for anyone who's building web sites. The world of mob rules isn't about web sites, it's about services. It's about things that the street uses and permutes indefinitely. The idea of web sites comes from a time before the network ate hierarchy. Sites are places where you go and follow the rules laid down by an information architect. Well, there's no way to enforce those rules. Think about this. The first Google Maps mashup didn't come from Google, or the second, or the third, or the hundredth. In fact, Google resisted the mashups. They claimed they violated their terms of use. Mashups come from the mob. It's the street finding its own use for things. And the interesting thing in this case is that the mob pushed on through. Google bowed down and obeyed. That is the single most important company of the internet era basically being kicked around by the mob as if it were a child's toy. Ponder that. Okay, this is the one that's going to get me in trouble, so I'm going to have a bit of a drink first. <clears throat> Advertising is a form of censorship. The web of 2007 is a house built upon sand. Nearly everything that's online hopes to fund itself through some form of advertising and sponsorship. Advertising is a demand that you pay attention. And it's a demand which can no longer be enforced. The mob doesn't like advertisements. It either ignores them or it actively filters them away. 